This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 28, Episode 4. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. You ready for me to let the folks know about the big show? Let's rock and roll. Okay, here's what we got coming up. We're going to talk about elementary OS. Specifically, we'll review the new Luna OS release. And this is something that a lot of people have been looking forward to. In fact, in, fact, in, in elementary OS's first official 1.0 release week, they've had over 100,000 downloads. Ooh. Yeah. Oh. And a lot of anticipation around this distro, and it's something we've watched for a long time, but actually haven't talked very much on the show. Well, I guess we did a couple of years ago, but yeah, it's been a, a while. Bit. It's been a while. Yeah. Been a while, not with the 1.0. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And they've been working on it for a long time, so it'll be interesting to dig mm -hmm. into that. And then in Slash Etsy, we'll tell you guys, we'll give you a little secrets on how to make a Slash Etsy segment. We're going to open it up to the community, and we're going to give you some tips what we're looking for, how we're going to do it. And a, little, and a few secrets to making a good Slash Etsy segment. I think after doing this, we're going to get some great submissions. Oh, I know from, we are. I know you guys are going to send us some great stuff. Yep. That'd be cool. And then in the feedback segment, we've got some good stuff, a few surprises. And, of course, we're going to cover the news this week. But first, Matt, it's our picks. And uh, I thought I'd start with, this made me smile so hard. It got 37 upvotes in our Linux Action Show subreddit. So awesome. Chris and Matt, make it to the Mile High Club. And run Linux. Woohoo! Yeah. And we kept our pants on. Yeah, so uh, if, you, uh, if you're not watching the video version, what we have here is Chris and Matt. That'd be us. That's all us? Probably doing, it uh, looks like, uh, last week's show. Yeah, I think it is last week's. And uh, we're way. sitting, I don't know what kind of cockpit this is in. That looks like it is a it's small Cessna or smaller. It's maybe? really cool, though. I yeah. mean, you know what I like right there is that big lever. In the oh, actually, no, that's not. That's got to be Cessna or bigger. Anybody that's in the chat room know yeah. what that is? If you knew. Uh, if if Noah's watching, I'm sure he could probably... Give us a give us a heads up. But yeah, I I, uh, I thought that was um, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Came from Colonel Oops. Yeah, that's cool. I'm trying. Like, now I'm totally wondering. I see the yoke. I got yeah. That's Not cool. a Cessna. They say. I'm gonna say if anybody. Uh, well, it probably. And I'm, is. I'm totally. Yeah, I'm only simulator guy. So we're at 5,200 feet. All right. And uh, so uh, I don't know. It doesn't nice. say. It doesn't say what kind of plane it is. Either way, we're in the air on a tablet, and that's cool. That is really cool. Maybe to be in the cockpit on a tablet. And look, he's got the headphone in, so you know he's not even listening to what's going on. We don't need airplay. We yeah. got this. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's cool. So there you go, yeah, man. That's really awesome. Now we're up in the sky running, running on a Linux machine, too. <laughs> that's so awesome. On this tablet. That's, that's really cool. That's really cool. All right. Well, so uh, this week, Matt, the Android pick promises. You might have saw a quick mm -hmm. glimpse of it last mm -hmm. week at the end of the show. Promises. To replace Siri. Matt claims it's his commuter's companion. Uh, you know, I don't I don't know how people do anything without it, honestly. Whoa. Especially if you drive. If you drive, oh man, yeah. Really? Or you just want to like look really douchey in front of people. It's kind of fun that way. Okay. Too. All right, now you got my attention. Yeah. Now, like, and that's important to yeah, me personally. I'm, now you've got me now you got me zeroed in. Well, first, uh, let me stop everybody and tell them about the great deal we've got from our yep. first sponsor this week. Go daddy.com. Yeah. So I'm having this conversation with an unnamed person last night, and mm. she's telling me about how uh, there's so many people using our code Linux249 when they check out at GoDaddy.com that she's actually just writing checks over to GoDaddy, and they're like, hey. Whoa. Yeah, they're say, and I can't say her name, but they'll just say, hey, Miss D, uh, mm -hmm. they've, people have been using way too many Linux 249. You know what she says, Dan? I mean, Whoop. person D says, I'm not going to cut them off. I'm going to fund them myself. So she's been busting out the checks. So every time you use the code Linux 249, Danica, I mean, somebody anonymously is personally buying that for you. Miss D is hooking it up. At least that's what I've been led to believe. I don't know why that would not be true. A true mm -hmm. statement. I have no other reason to think that. <laughs> uh, also, though, if you you know if you got some other things you want to get, we've got a great code to take thirty two percent off your first order. Just use the code go thirty two off to go thirty two off to go. Daddy has a new express checkout pathway. And if you, you only get it if you use the link in our show notes because we got the super secret link to hook up from a certain secret agent. Not going to say who. Not going to say, say who. I'm not going to say who. I won't. Uh, but if you, use that, if you use that link in our show notes, when you click that, you get a much more streamlined checkout process. You get That's in, awesome. laser strike what you want, you get out. I had a question. So um, All right. I'm thinking in the next week or two here on the big show, depending on what happens in you know, my personal life and sure. whatnot, I think we should cover setting up our own email server. Oh, that would be sweet. So if anybody can think of a really great .com, now don't go buy it. Because no, then I can't go no, buy it. No. But if anybody can think of a great .com I could use for my own email, something for my wife and I to use, not Jupiter mm -hmm. Broadcasting, just our mm -hmm. personal email accounts. A family 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly. So maybe eventually we could even you know create email accounts for our kids at and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, leave us a comment or a suggestion wherever you watch this, and then I'll go use that code Linux two forty nine to check out. You can do the same. Whatever you need a dot com for to forward to your social profile for an invitation to something. Uh, for your own email account, or if you've got a Gmail account, but you just want to be able to keep it pointing at your own domain and then just point and have that mail go wherever you want when you move, go over to GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux249. Get that .com for $2.49. That's a nice. ridiculously great deal. It's crazy cheap. Thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Woo! I hope I get some uh, FisherHome.com. It'd be good. It'd be good if it's not already taken. Yeah, we're already getting suggestions in the chat room. And of course, again, uh, maybe bit message him, email. Oh yeah, you know, something, like, yeah. You know, yep. something a little under the radar so no one else registers. So, um, well, I'm just going to trust the good community. That could, yeah, that could I, but if they take it, then they take it. They take it. They take it. They take yeah. it. Uh, boy, look at all these great ones. So, by oh, the way, wow. the Linux Action Show is live on Sundays at 10 a.m. Pacific, which is, by the way, 5 p.m. UTC, and uh, that's 3 a.m. in Sydney, Australia. Whoa! Yeah. That's so, a committed, uh, committed down under there. Yeah. yeah uh, I feel bad for those guys. But you can, you're always welcome to join us live in our IRC chat room. And kick around with us. Plus, you get a lot more show. We do a lot of stuff in between segments that never mm -hmm. make it into the recording because otherwise the recording would be like three gigabytes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy, Matt. Crazy, man. All right. So let's talk about your Android pick. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to install it right now as we go, and maybe, right. you, can, uh, maybe you can teach me about it. So it's called It's called Robin. Robin. Not to be confused with Batman. Uh, Robin is essentially designed to be a Siri alternative for Android. What? What? Now, let me back up here. There's like a billion different apps that supposedly do this. I've tried them all. They yeah. all suck. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. all really suck. It's a hard thing to get right. Well, these guys appear to be latching on to what Google, uh, you know, the Google uh, Google Now, I think they call it. You know, Google Now is doing. Yeah, yeah. They, they kind of latch onto that. So it integrate, It works with Google it Now? It seems to, but it doesn't. It, it does a lot of stuff on its own. So hmm. I've actually got a couple of demos that I'm going to read off. Oh, yeah? Here. Okay, all right. All right, so I'm going to try and get this. Hopefully this doesn't send too much feedback. Let's see. Yeah. Give it a shot. I'm, I've also got it installed over here so we can. Uh, okay. Let me just do a quick one here. Come on, Toby. That's more like your phone. I'm ready. Oh, it's because I have my volume. Uh, oh, yeah, we turned down for the show. Oh. I've got, I'm installing it right now, and it's downloading yeah. extra packages. Okay. Whoa, yeah, hello. We're not going to talk about that, though, Robin. We're gonna... Yikes. Yikes. Yeah, she's a... Uh, that got she... dirty fast, man. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's uh, she's something else. All right, so let's try that one more time without the uh, commentary. All right, <laughs> well, from Robin. Robin, what is the best show on the Internet? Robin, what is the best show on the internet? The Linux Action Show, of that, course. Uh, well, well, of course. I mean, come on. Clearly, the, okay, r right there, she wins the internet. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right, let's see. Uh, hey, let me try Robin a little bit. Yeah, here. go ahead. Let me. All right, so uh, okay, so open a web browser. Okay, opening web browser. Oh, that's cool. And you can pick a default. I think it has yeah, a Yeah, so I picked that. Chrome. All right, so I'm going to try. Okay, what else should I tell Robin to do? Uh, let's try. Here, go ahead and do uh, make reminder to calendar, get milk and eggs for day and time. Make a reminder on my calendar to get the milk and eggs for Monday at 3 p.m. See what she does. Loading. It's loading. Okay. Adding to your calendar a reminder to my calendar to get the milk and eggs for Monday on Sunday, August 18th at 3 p.m. Is that right? No. No, let's try. Let me try. No, but she got it close. I think it was the way I said it more than anything because uh, I think I. Oh, let Whatever me try. Whatever you say. Yeah. Whatever you say. Call me William Shatner. Nice to meet you, William Shatner. All right. Okay. So <laughs> another thing has been checked right. off the list. Make a reminder to count. Make a reminder to calendar. Get milk and eggs Monday, 4 p.m. Okay. Adding to your calendar reminder. Calendar. Get milk and eggs on Monday, August 19th at 4 p.m. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You're, you're controlling mine too. Oh, am I? Yeah, and it worked. No, it look, it did the oh, same did it exact really? thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Although it did do the calendar twice, but yeah, I, the reason why I do calendar like that is because it will then do, uh, it'll basically sync it to my local calendar, which is all fine and dandy, but then there becomes an Android issue to where I'm trying to not make that my default calendar, and I'm not having a lot of luck there. What's cool, too, is it seems to have pretty heavy integration with maps, right? So, exactly. Um, let's see, let's just try, let's try a few things. Yeah, um, with your GPS on, ask it to find you, ask it to find you a, a, a good hamburger. hamburger. Yeah. 
That that's where it gets cool. Find me a good hamburger. Okay, looking for hamburgers near you. Huh? I found several options. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. and then, one is uh, yeah, and then you can do uh, find me a laundry mat. Find me. I tried. I tried some more illicit uh, ideas. I didn't actually. Surprisingly, it was kind of close. But anyway, so yeah, it was uh, it was kind of interesting to play with. Um, it also you can uh, ask it really obscure questions, and commentary from it can get pretty interesting. Let and me try you can one train more. It. Let me try my most important thing. Okay. okay. What is thirty percent of a hundred dollar bill? That's really. I'm thinking. Really? That's a really and easy the one. The answer is thirty. Okay. All right, got it. Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> no, I wondered the bill got. So you. you know, that's just a good one for like tip. So like, if Absolutely. you get like a weird uh, restaurant bill or something like that. Okay, so that's called Robin, and it's free too, right? Exactly. Uh, when you're driving, and I won't demo this because I drive my wife uh, wife nuts. You can make phone calls. You can reply to texts. You can send a text. Um, it's actually and it's actually pretty good about it. Even if you're doing speakerphone driving down the road, it's actually pretty accurate. And now, do you do you are you able to set do you know a quick key to activate it? Uh, with some phones, if you have a gesture, uh, or I suppose it would like, I guess it would also depend on your desk, like on mine. So check this out. So I, I have Nova Launcher mm -hmm. as my Android launcher, yeah. and if I swipe up on the screen, it automatically launches Google Now, and I set that in Nova Launcher. Mm -hmm. So I could probably set that same action to launch. You can Robin. with Nova Launcher, and also I think when I first launch mine, I can actually change the preset to actually launch Robin instead of Google Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I believe that'll work as yeah. well. So you got hand gestures, you got the up movement. Cool. Works with text, phone calls. Um, it's free. It's actually pretty good. Like I said, I've tried probably half a dozen other ones. Yeah. This is by far the best. Let's try one more. Uh, just one more because I see on here that it's got, <laughs> and one, this could be kind of handy. Uh, is, Especially if you're driving and someone's like, you need to text them back and you're in a hurry. It's just like, ah. You know. All right, let me try Robin one more time. Get me. Oops. Time. Oh. And if you need a backup one, you just hit your back and it'll shut her up. Got some catching up to do. <laughs> she tells jokes too. Oh, yeah. Give me a traffic report. Sure. Showing traffic near you. That's cool. So mm -hmm. Now it's showing me the traffic near me. I like that. See, so yeah, there's definitely, there's per perhaps, like, I don't think you can do that with, oh, let me see, can you launch an application? I think um, so. All right. Uh, what, uh, let's see. Play music. Playing music. Yeah, and then it, it chooses what I want to launch, mm -hmm. and so now it launched Google Play. Yep. Well, that is cool. All right. Where it kind of fell down was uh, when sending email, what, even after I got it configured to work, it doesn't seem to work real well with Gmail, so I tell it to email. So oh, really? So, That's da, funny. Da, 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 and it just opens up a blank compose, which is kind of like, eh. Well, could then you, after it does that, could you start dictating? I guess Yeah, so, you right? could. Yeah, you just, it's just hit a little, little clunkier, mic. Just, right? Yeah, just, and then you got to hit your mic button and just do it the old school way. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But it does well. You can dictate texts, and it works really well, and you can make and receive phone calls, make and receive texts. It's, you know, it's pretty good for hands-free goodies. There you go. That, that. <coughs> and it's got a little demo video there. That too. is Robin. Oh, yeah? Oh, let's take a look. Hmm. Oh, yeah, it does. That is too funny. Well, we won't play this whole thing. <laughs> but it's a guy but who it is, puts it's a guy who is, like, held captive. How to untie knots. <laughs> Certainly. Begin by pushing back on the tight areas to loosen their hold on the rope. All right, that's kind of funny. That's kind of a funny... <laughs> All right, I have a really, really, really cool um, desktop pick for uh, Linux today, nice. and it's a command line one. I wanted to get back to command mm -hmm. line for a little Definitely. bit, and it was submitted by uh, Pisa Maker, I believe it was, in the IRC chat room. I, I noted it here in the show notes to, mm -hmm. so I could give him a uh, yeah, Peacemaker. Peacemaker cool. made this uh, recommendation in the IRC. It's called Aria Two. I'm gonna I'm gonna say Aria. It could be Aria. Yeah, Aria. Uh, Aria. Could be Arethia. I don't know. Uh, let me show it to you. What it is? It is you know W get. Yes, I'll throw that I used crap the hell out of that. Throw that. You throw know, it to the curb. You know, That's curl. Like a go to thing. Do you know, oh, curl. curl. Throw it away. Delete throw it. Throw like curl. RM, RM, RF. Get it off your it's computer. It's not like Carl's curl. I this like is going to replace it. It is wow. awesome. It is that good. Wow. This right. is the next generation downloading command line utility. It's a lightweight, wow, okay. multi protocol, multi source command line download utility. It supports HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, BitTorrent. Whoa. Okay. And now you got my attention. Hold, yeah. Hang on. So you Whoa. don't care. You don't, you know, you're fancy free. You just say, hey, Aria, uh, go download some crap for me. So here, here's an example. I'll just give it this, um, well, I don't want the ISO. Oh, man, I want the torrent. Uh, so I'll give it here this uh, torrent file, right? Okay. Now, this could also be an ISO sitting on an, on an FTP server. Sure. Uh, whatever. You hit enter. It's smart enough. says, oh, shoot, son, that's HTTP, or I'm sorry, that's BitTorrent. I'll just start downloading as a BitTorrent client. Dude, seriously. Yeah, and so you, and then, you know, or same if you're throwing Well, off and of what it. was neat is all you did is the command, aria 2 c yeah. and then you just did basically what yeah. the file name was, not the entire location. I didn't have to be like, I didn't Weird have to be like dash dash 
type is torrent no. dash share ratio. It should be this hyphen, hyphen, dash. Hyphen. Yeah, no, it just <laughs> takes care of all of that and automatically figures it out. What's really wow. cool. What's neat is if uh, you know maybe you're a bit of a loon and uh, you want to you want to step things up a bit. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you think your Pac-Man on your Arch Linux box could be a little faster. You can actually oh. bolt a RIA two in there as a lightweight down you download utility that has resumable support and segmented HTTP no and FTP downloads. So it could download it can do multiple simultaneous downloads when you're from an Arch mirror. Oh, dude! See, oh, now that's nice. Yeah, so now can, we're talking. Yeah, you just yeah. slide this guy in place. You slide mm. a RIA in there. Boom. Kind of, and, it's a lot uh, of cupping action there. Yeah. You know? oh, see that? See that right there? Yeah, cupping action. Boom, puts it I'm right in there. the moon. Yeah. So anyways, that is a RIA 2, and it should be in your local d distro's repository. That's cool. Open source and free. And yeah, I, I, I was playing around with it, and uh, when I actually used it to download elementary OS and... Uh, just to see if it works, it works just fine. Download yeah, the whole thing via really nice. I think it's all. It, I think it's the easy use, and then the massive amount of support for all the different stuff that mm -hmm. really gets me going. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's like, hey, right. I know the file name. Don't care where you get it. Just make it happen. Shoot, son, love it. All right. Cool. So uh, a couple of just uh, bits of uh, business I want to take care of before we get out of here, Matt. Uh, number one is if you'd like to help Jupiter Broadcasting, or you have helped Jupiter Broadcasting with a development project, like you know we had folks make soundboards. Right. We have. Cool Rikai, stuff. who makes a tons of great stuff. We have people that make the Android apps and the XBMC app. Well, uh, Rikai in our IRC chat room has set up a Jupyter Dev page to sort of oh, start wow. the process of connecting everybody, linking everybody's GitHub repo so you can mm. see the source. If you want to contribute to our extension or you want to contribute to a bot, you can go in to uh, dev.jbirc.com in your web browser of choice. That's and so we've cool. got contact links now to the developers of the different uh, applications that sort of surround the JB ecosystem and links to their GitHub pages. It's also kind of cool to actually give a... It's a nice way of giving a permanent shout-out yep. and a credit to yep. the folks that have put in all the hard work making these things. Absolutely. So awesome. And uh, gives you an idea of what we have that's available, yeah. too. So that's dev.jbirc.com. Nice. We have it linked in the show notes, too. If you guys want to check it out and get involved, that's a good way to start and a good way to get a hold of those folks. So thanks to Rekai for putting yeah. that together, too. Thanks, guys. Um, and then there's one last bit of business uh, I want to mention. Uh, <laughs> you might have noticed if you're reading GigaOM or other popular news oh websites. Yeah. Uh, new Linux podcast yep, launched yep, last yep, week. Yep. Linux Unplugged. A new show uh, from your boys you right here, and uh, it is a no-format uh, spinoff of the Linux Action Show. We, we take a lot of feedback and inspiration from this show. We work into that show, plus we've got some community stuff we're working on in there. We'll give you more details about that in a little bit. Good reception to the first episode. Really good reception. This is about, this is about as close as you're going to get to just, like, hanging out with us. I mean, this is, this is it. Yeah. You know. If we were sitting at a bar, yeah, exactly. like the Irishman down in Everett, yeah. maybe drinking some beers, mm -hmm. and, and I'd get, like, a burger because they got really good bacon... And, and that's important. Yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. And then some onion rings because they got uh, really good onion rings. Yeah. And then we were just sitting there talking about Linux a lot. And maybe we had like our laptops to read emails sure. and chat room. Absolutely. And we had like people on a Google Hangout or a Mumble server. Or just a bunch of people piled in the booth. That's you know? true. That could be like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyways, uh, check it out. First episode's out. And we're going to do it on Mondays so for now. We might move it around a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd love to have you join us live because that's a big part of it. And I think we're still kind of feeling out as to what technologies are best to make this yeah. happen. Yeah. Or, you know, whether it be a mumble or a Google Hangout or what it might be. I, I think, yeah, I don't know if we'll be able to switch by Monday, but uh, I think yeah. we're going to go mumble just so that way uh, we kind of... Been reading a lot of... Everybody keeps saying that it's just super simple. So, maybe, well, it's something we may look into. Yeah. You know, but we did a Hangout that. last week. Yeah. It, it mixed yeah, results, yeah. yeah. We, we made it work for what it was. Yeah. You know. yeah. I, I had a good time, though. And oh, yeah. it's interesting because in that episode, we talked about too much choice in the mm -hmm. desktop. And then this week, we're going to review a distribution that tackles that very problem. Yes. So it's very uh -huh. interesting. The two things come together. And I think you're going to find that a lot. Linux Unplugged and Linux Action Show, a lot of times, we'll start a topic in one show, and then it'll continue into the other show. They won't be mandatory that you watch them. We'll, no. we'll try to be very cognizant of not doing that to you. But I think in a lot, like, I think today, we're going to have a conversation about elementary OS. Matt and I are going to get up from this table. We're going to go on with our lives, and then a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't mention in the review is going to come to us, yep. and then we're going to sit down tomorrow on Monday and talk about all of that stuff. The chat room's going to explode with, well, why didn't they talk about blank? Well, you yeah. guys didn't, yeah. you didn't, <laughs> you didn't touch on this, and these are all valid points, but sure. we needed a venue and a location and a means for right. you guys to share that. That's what this is. And I would actually underscore your point there. It's more important than ever now that if you guys want to give us your feedback and thoughts, now that we're, fun now that we're essentially funding two shows with your feedback, we've yes. got Linux Action Show and Linux Unplugged, your interaction and your involvement in the subreddit, in the comments, in the email right. is more important than ever. It's being at this point. It's going to be. Uh, it's going to be. Um, 
We're probably going to hopefully, I don't know. I don't know if we'll get to all of it. We're, eventually, I hope we're going to be staying current on a weekly that basis with everything awesome. coming in. Yeah. It'd certainly give us the you know potential. Yeah. So I'm really excited yeah. about the uh, future progress of Linux Unplugged. And for the mm -hmm. first episode, it's gone really well. And I think it's only going to get better from here. I'm excited. So you can find that over on jupiterbroadcasting.com. Go subscribe. The RSS feeds are up now. So you can get it weekly nice. and don't even have to worry about it. Nice. All right, Matt. Let's do the news. It's the news, and this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Ting, Matt, is mobile that makes sense. And now Ting is our mobile service provider. That's mm. right. Matt and I are both Ting users, mm -hmm. just as of right now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Woo. Yay! Matt got a Note 2. Actually, the Note 2. I, I, I currently am rocking the HTC One, which I, I conclude is p potentially the best smartphone ever made, especially if you're a podcast and Audible listener, because the speakers on that oh, phone are gorgeous. just so good. But that Note 2 is definitely a second runner. The screen size, there's, you, you don't have any idea how much you love the real estate until you have it. Yeah. Here's the great thing about Ting phones. All of them are unlocked. All of them are contract free. None of them have any early termination fees with your Ting account. There's no overage charges, no penalties. In fact, the way Ting service works is pretty unique, pretty incredible. Go to last.ting.com. You go over there, you'll get $25 off your first device. Good stuff. Or you can take $25 off your first month if you're going to bring a device like uh, Matt here is. And they've got a knowledge base that tells you which devices you can bring. In fact, uh, we got a note here from uh, Tex, the admin. He wrote and said, hi, everyone. I just wanted to share my recent experience switching my mobile service over to Ting. Uh, he says, by the way, JB is not compensating me for this. After hearing about Ting on last, I decided to make the switch from Metro PCS after estimating I could probably cut my phone bill in half. He says wow. he found the knowledge base t on Ting's website that says which Sprint phones he could bring and how to update with all step-by-step -step instructions on setting up things like MMS. When it came time to activate my phone, though, I got an error. But I decided to call her support number. And this I, is a good. This is good. This is good. And after calling, the phone rang one time, and then an actual human being picked up the phone. I explained the situation. He got it all settled for me. He went in there and got them all set up, and they found out that the phone was already active on another on another person's account. Ting was able to get that resolved and point him in the right direction. He said, "I'm super excited about Ting. Their website is awesome and lets you control pretty much everything related to your account from the dashboard without having to call customer service or go into a store." My replacement phone should be coming tomorrow, and oh, I use wow. last.ting.com to get $25 credit on my account. Nice. And uh, actually, just before we started the news segment, I logged into my Ting account, went into devices, deactivated the Note 2 off my device, and now Matt just goes to last.ting.com, right. clicks on activate, and he's going to have it on his account within like 15 minutes. Not even that. Not, not even, even that. No. Well, what was cool Five is when minutes? you deactivated it, no phone calls. It no. took as long as a page takes to reload on broadband. Yeah. And that was it. It was awesome. Boom, boom. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm a big, big fan of Ting, and I'm also a big fan of the way they charge. Uh, they break your rates up by minutes. You got text messages, your megabytes, mm -hmm. and they just bill you at the end of the month for whatever bucket you fall into. Oh, yeah. Super, super straightforward. In fact, uh, if I go look at my account right now, now I only have, uh, I'm down to one phone on my account, but I have a feeling that's going to change soon. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, my, my, I'm about halfway into my billing cycle right now, okay? I'm going to pay $18. Now, until, this, until just oh, about oh. five minutes ago, I had two phones active yeah. on this account. You just pay a flat rate of $6 a month per line, and then you just pay for what you use. So right now, this month, I'm going to pay $18 for, honestly, what is the most flexible, powerful phone servers I've ever had on one of the best smartphone devices I think's ever been built. That's like the best of everything all rolled up into one handy totally. little package. Totally. Go to last.ting.com. Save some money the first time you sign up. And uh, by the way, included in your plan... Tethering and hotspot. Ooh, yeah. So bat, boom! You just got you oh, just got tethering yeah. hotspot right there, buddy. Oh, and I already got eyeball. I already know what I'm gonna be doing with this bad boy. Yeah, and I think you've got uh, I think you've got 4G up in your neck of the woods uh -huh. too. So that's gonna uh -huh. be awesome. Go over to last.ting.com. Check out what they can do. And if you get stuck, you can always give them a call one eight five five ting FTW. If you call between eight a.m. and eight p.m., a real human being is gonna answer the phone. Score. That's, I love that. love that. And that's that makes it that makes me comfortable letting my family use Ting because mm -hmm. I know I'm not the one getting the call. Because yeah. honestly. Ting's better at answering the phone than I am. By like a big, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah. one ring. I mean, yeah. what was cool is yeah. that they had the experience of, you know, okay, things didn't exactly work out as planned, and they got to experience the customer service. That's really awesome. Yeah, yeah. I like that. So uh, thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action Show, and thanks to you guys for checking them out. Go get yourself a nice phone and pair it with mobile service that empowers you, that doesn't take advantage of you. Exactly. Thanks, Ting. Good stuff. All right, Matt, uh, let's start with the news this week. I thought we'd say happy birthday to the folks over at Debian, who oh my goodness, 20 
this week. And they got a rock and cake. That is a rock and cake, isn't it? it is. I hope that's raspberry or strawberry. I bet it's I'm, strawberry. <laughs> or, or something from Dexter. But yeah, I'm going to go with the uh, ra raspberry <laughs> myself. I think that looks pretty tasty. Ian Murdoch founded the Debian Project back in 1993, which turned out to be a truly free community project aiming to build the free Linux operating systems. Mm -hmm. 20 years later, Debian has grown to be one of the most influential, influential and largest open source project used as a base in many popular Linux distros, such as Ubuntu. Nice. Being dubbed the universal operating system, Debian is available in 70 languages, supporting an enormous range of computer types with over 20,000 software packages for more than 10 computer architectures. And to kind of put that in perspective, think about it this way. Uh, your live disk CDs, such as Canopix, uh, oh, yeah. you know, simply Mepis, uh, Shutter, if you will, Linspire. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that have been based on Debian over the years that are really, really important distributions that have been mile markers through, yeah. uh, through life. Yeah, ones that have been really big players. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, Debian was the first, like, actual in-production... Uh, it might have been Red Hat, but Debian was real close in there. And I remember switching... So back, back when I started using Debian, app-git was, was real magic. Oh, yeah. I mean, nobody had anything like that that I knew of. Maybe, maybe some of the BSDs did, but I, I certainly had... Not in, not in Linux, no. After, no. after banging my head against the wall with Red Hat and coming yeah. to Debian, I mean, it's just like, oh, yeah. Back then, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's nice. You didn't have uh, back then. You didn't have Yum. Mm -mm. You, or, or, a little bit later on, you started to get apt for RPM. Yeah. Remember apt for uh, RPM? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then a little later, Mandrake had uh, UPMI or URPMI. Mm -hmm. Mandrake uh, did some good things. Yeah. Sure. But Debian really was, uh, I just remember being like magic. It's like, whoa, well, wow. Well, it was consistent. It wasn't like, oh, what are we going to break or have an issue with now? It just worked. And yep. It worked really well. So we said uh, at the beginning of the season we'd be talking about mm -hmm. mobile a little bit this mm -hmm. season. <laughs> Yeesh, little mobile. Seems to be the direction of things, Matt. Yeah, well, yeah. great news uh, from ZTE. For those of you wanting to get your hands on a Firefox OS phone, they've opened Ooh. up an eBay store. And uh, this is a damn good-looking eBay store. Actually, yeah, that's... Whoa. Isn't that, that like the that, best? That really should be like a how you do it, especially in it being it's Firefox. Orange is appropriate before you guys rank on it. I would say this is the best-looking eBay store I have ever seen. Yeah. I mean, and that looks like a just an e-commerce, a really well-done e-commerce store. So uh, you can get yourself uh, a ZTE Firefox OS-powered phone, and mm. uh, they've got all kinds of great deals. $162 is the bid on this one right now, but it's wow. GSM unlocked. So you're going to get it with Firefox. That's kind of cool. Yeah, totally, totally open. One gigahertz Cortex A5 uh, with assisted GPS. It's got mm -hmm. a 3G chip in there. Cool. No, no 4G, but let's be, you know, come that's on. Okay. Honestly, it really okay. is okay. Considering their target market. That's and for battery. I mean, yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, true. when I get 4G, honestly, it does feel like I'm living in the future. And <laughs> it does. Yeah. Like, I, I, uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, Ting has been turning on 4G like crazy, and right. uh, so I've been, it's been lighting up in new areas for me. And when I'm, it's like, oh yeah, you need me to go grocery shopping? Oh yeah, yeah, we, I'll go to the yeah, we have four, we just got 4G in my area, yeah. so that's pretty exciting. So about awesome. That. Uh, so, but you know, not a big loss really. And Firefox OS, of course, getting you know a chance to get your hands on this seems pretty worth it too. I think so. Yeah, I, I like the fact that I think this is a really good introduction to smartphones for people or people that want to just develop for uh, Firefox OS. Uh, so, you know, like, uh, like GigaOM points out here, it is kind of an unusual tactic for a major phone manufacturer, and ZTE is one of those, to sell directly to consumers via eBay. In mm -hmm. fact, I don't think it's ever really been done. But it does arguably make the most sense in cases like this. And you wonder, I mean, I don't want to get all canonical on us. I don't want to change gears already. Oh, yeah. But uh, canonical, that. you know, they did, they did just smash records for, mm -hmm. um, they, they blasted past the pebble as the biggest crowdfunded campaign ever. When Which they is cool. 10.3 million. Yeah. I guess, you know, the difference here is they didn't have anything already built, whereas ZTE is sort of established as building. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I admire what they did. I think considering the challenge that was presented to them, they, they, did, they did well. You know, looking at the Indiegogo now, it's $11.1 .1 million. Which is crazy, right? Four days left to go. So it'll wrap up before the next Linux Action Show. So I imagine we're going to talk about it, sort of do a, right. uh, uh, an analysis of whatever mm -hmm, happens. Mm-hmm. Seems pretty locked in. It's not going to reach funding. Yeah, no, I was, and I was thinking maybe something at the last minute will, uh, short of like a like a team of super corporations yeah. coming in and swooping yeah. in with crazy VC cash or something. I, it's not going to happen. You know, the only way I could, you know, at this yeah. point, like Foxconn could be like, all right, we want to manufacture this for you, and we will yeah. fund it. Yeah, I, I would even get, yeah, I think that if you account for corporations, maybe they got maybe a 5%, 10% chance. That's being pretty generous. And uh, Q5 says is asking in the chat room what happens, you know, if they don't reach their goal. 
it goes back to the people. Yeah, who my understanding is I think they put like an authorization on funds and yeah. then it's released yep. or something. Yep. Like Pay, your money yeah. will show back up in your right. PayPal account after a few days. Yeah. Um, you know, is, the more yeah. I reflect on this, Matt, now, now that we're just four days into it, and then after next week we probably won't be talking about it too much, sure. but the more I reflect on it, I think they're now in that area where everyone's convinced it won't reach funding, so nobody's jumping in. Like yeah, it's a yeah. psychological barrier that everybody's up against. And we've now. seen that with uh, something going public. We've seen it with various stocks. We've also seen it with uh, other companies and just adoption in general. Yeah. Um, something gets poo pooed and it's like, oh, okay, well, that's it. Don't bother. And I think the other, another thing they're up against is the U.S. consumer, which, by the way, the U- U.S. is the largest source of, of backing for this project. But, uh, you know, like Rotten Corpse is saying right now, he says in the chat room, I'm not going to pay $700 to wait for a year for a phone. Exactly. And I think when yeah. you have, like, when you, when you look at a, a big problem, and this is something uh, that I think has to change, is people are used to paying one ninety nine for a cell phone. Mm-hmm. Even though we all know that it includes this treacherous contract that right. actually you end up paying more like $2,200 in a lot of cases for a phone That's when right. you conclude the contract. You're paying for it, you just don't pay for it up front. Uh, and, you know, when I look at this, I think, gosh, these are good specs. Mm-hmm. Can dual boot. That could be a ton of fun. It could be a very unique phone that could be... And wouldn't that, just as a geek, wouldn't it be nice to have, like, a phone that very, 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 very few people have? Like, that's just kind of that a would be, thing. That has a nice novelty to it. Yeah, sure, especially sure. in this day and age when there's so many mass-manufactured phones. It's kind of like back in the day when you had a custom-built, awesome PC rig, right? Right. Uh, that used to be my thing, too. I yeah, guess, I you know, and so I'm a little sad I because, A... Canonical is not going to stop pushing towards mobile, so it's not like it's going to change no. the direction of the company when this doesn't no. when this doesn't succeed. It just means we're not going to have a cool device to load it on. However, I think it does mean they'll double down on existing devices. So people who are rocking Note twos, for example, will probably get an image. You know, that's where they're going to probably start. Well, and I think where they really dropped the balls, they did some really great marketing at the beginning. Uh, they did both some very limited uh, marketing on YouTube and video, and then they did a lot of their marketing in like trade showy type environments, which yeah. eh, that doesn't really work. So that is so, one of the biggest yeah. misnomers, I think, about the industry is everybody thinks going to these conventions is like this boots on the ground, word of it's mouth. Not. But the, the problem is, is those things no longer work unless you are a huge company that can, that can strategically dominate the headlines and coordinate with the gadget blogs and, and, and wine and dine the, right. the journalists. It doesn't work. It's not a way to spread the news. And you don't go outside that bubble. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I mean, I think the bigger piece, especially when it comes to technology products, is that it's used in conjunction with obvious means, not as a primary source like they've been doing. And I don't think yeah. that necessarily works out so well for them. But, you know. Um, I, I'm so I'm mixed. I'm mixed. I'm definitely I'm definitely mixed on it. But we'll see what happens. I mean, it is going to be the story of 2013. Mm-hmm. One of the big stories of 2013. If this thing hits its funding, now. I like the phone concept. I want to see it succeed, but they really need to quit kidding themselves in how they market these things. They if they're going to do this, they need to really do it. Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm being hard on. Don't you think? I'm don't you hard, think but... they've done the best within their means? Like they did a countdown. They did these big streams. They released videos. What, 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 you know, at what point? Okay, I'm on. I'm on a ver- ton of their mailing lists and stuff like that. I want to see video updates to where they've talked about the talked about the progress. I want to see some behind the scenes of people that they're getting ready to even. I don't care how preliminary it is. They're shopping around for the people to build them. I want to see something. Yeah. Besides a besides a shell. I agree with you, you know? there. And, and the other and thing. So, that's all. It, they never got. They never got into like the techno lust crowd. The people who want the new Android devices. The people that are lusting over the yeah. S4 or the HTC One. They never broke into that gadget fiend market. They always just stayed within the people who are aware of things like Firefox OS. Right. People who are aware of Jala. People are all. They never really broke out of that group. Not only that. Not only that, but it's something that occurred to me as we were going through this is that with the phone itself, having uh, you know having a shell is great. But I think having a working prototype that you can literally then demo and ask any app developer, they'll tell you that you need to have something to demo, matters. And because there really wasn't, not really, I mean genuinely, that kind of hurt them. Because then you could, in fact, really show off different features and functionality, get people interested and excited about it. And that really didn't happen, in my opinion. It's, yeah. It didn't really excite me as much as it should have. I, I like the prospect of it, but I, I'm not quite there as to why I care yet. Hmm. I don't know. I, I want to be. Yeah, you were never you were never really motivated to fund it. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, for me, it's like, help me understand the problem it's solving. Help me understand what I'm right. doing with all the apps that I already have invested money in. How are you going to help me transition yeah. out of that? Help me understand. Think, do you think there is, and then we should probably move on, but don't, yeah, you, yeah. don't you, do you think there is just like a certain value that people assign to a phone? Like, I was thinking yeah. about it, like, I, you know. I don't like using the phone. I like to use the phone for the data. Like on my Ting account, I use tons of data and hardly any voice. On this Ubuntu Edge, 
I would do the same thing. And for me, yeah. I kind of look at it and go, God, I kind of like to just go around without a phone. To be honest, like if I had, if I could, if I could be that guy and yeah. I didn't have kids and a wife to worry about, right, right, right. I probably wouldn't carry a phone at all. I would carry a phone. Okay, so here's what it is for me, and I'll and I'll and I'll just go and drop it at this point. I don't give a flying butt cheek what kind of phone it is. I want I want fast access to apps. I want good performance, and I want a workflow that doesn't want to make me punch random people. Yeah. If we can achieve those three things, I'm interested. I've seen zero evidence that this has done that. So therefore, so is this... I you know kind of it kind of loses me. I know Android what it does. It's shortcomings. It's bus pluses. I know what I'm getting into. But I have no idea what I'm getting into. Right. It's the devil you know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. So anyway. Android wins. Yeah. You know, for now. Well, and maybe, and maybe, you know, the, so Firefox OS is definitely taking a much different route. Oh, and I, I can I, get my hands on one. Right. I mean, I mean, and essentially and they're both price. web-based situations. I mean, it's, you know, totally different ecosystems yeah. and whatnot, but I can actually have a reason to care. I'm more excited about that than I am the, about, about uh, the Ubuntu phone, hmm. honestly. Hmm. And I'm not even in the market, but at least I can actually play with one. Hmm. I actually yeah. got to play with one at that one, uh, Linux, Linux Fest. Yeah, yeah, Linux Fest. I mean, yeah. pff, come on. Anyway. All yeah. right. <clears throat> so let's talk. Let's get now. Let's get out of game, let's get out of mobile and get right down to desktops. Uh, and uh, we'll start with something that we haven't talked a ton about. We covered it earlier in the year. The Steam Linux stats have just been all over the map yeah. as they've like they've been including stuff in this other column and then they've been pulling it out of other and then counting towards Linux yeah. distros specifically. And things have been moving around and it's been this big moving target. Mm -hmm. They've kind mm -hmm. of they've kind of settled and they've broken things out into a little more distro specific. And when you do the math right, uh, you're seeing some big growth actually yes. in Steam usage uh, for Linux. Uh, some on the lower end, 7% increase, but mm. on the higher end, 22% increase in Steam usage. Wow. Um, the big winner... Just looking, maybe almost uh, game-specific or slash games and uh, distro release-specific, that kind of thing? I find it interesting. Look at this. Look at this. 0.43% mm. of Linux users, or of, of Steam users, I guess, 0.43% mm -hmm. of Steam users are on Ubuntu 13.04. It's had a 7% increase since the last stats. Okay. Second place is Ubuntu 12.04, 64 bit. Now, if I recall, the official <laughs> Steam supported platform is Ubuntu 12.04, 32 bit. That's, I believe it is. Yeah, that's actually lower on, that's even lower than 13.04, 32 bit. I, I think what we're showing here is that people are saying, I don't care what the. With, oh. I know some folks really stick to the Steam supported platform, but some folks aren't. Ubuntu dominating, even once you get. So Ubuntu's got like the first to five slots. Then you get down to Linux 64-bit. That's probably Arch. Right. Oh, I'm sure of it. And then Mint comes in after that. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, total now, Linux of proportion of users is 1.06%, give or take. Well, I think when it comes to Steam expectations, they say, okay, Ubuntu, Shmoodundu, it runs on Linux, right? Great. I expect it to work. And so there's that expectation going yeah. in. And so I see those numbers shifting around a lot yeah. in that people are saying, I'd rather run a 64-bit distro versus a 32 and I yeah. actually think these numbers are a little low. I agree with yeah. the chat room. I think it's more like 1.69 or so that percent. That sounds more accurate. Because there's another category that, like, they're not attributing to Linux. And when, when there wasn't Steam for Linux, that other category was almost non-existent. Ah, you know? so probably is what's going on yeah. there. Uh, yeah. But it's just hard to name the distro. Because you have to have a specific file in your yeah. Etsy directory that says what it is for Steam to read. And if you don't have that file, which most Arch users don't unless, unless you install true. packages that require it. Yeah, why do it, right? Yeah. So no, our, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Big release this week, KDE 4.11 of Plasma Workspaces hit the web. I'll just quickly tell you a little bit about it. Uh, they're gearing up now for that long-term version of KDE where they're going to be start working on version 5. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, 4.11 is building towards the, a nice stable 4 series to leave behind. Nice. Uh, we got, uh, you got a much improved K-Mix, the little uh, audio applet. It's funny, I could show you normally, but I'm on mm -hmm. elementary OS today. Sure. But... Um, They've also included uh, improvements to KWIN, uh, memory, uh, memory improvements. The uh, search indexing backend has been improved as well. And uh, they've, and I haven't gotten to try this. This is the part I'm looking forward to the most. Supposedly improved multi-monitor handling quite a bit. Oh, well, yeah. that would be good. Yeah. That would definitely be good. I, I haven't had a ton of trouble with it just because I actually have a configuration file that just does it for me. Nice. But I know using the existing tools, it's pretty much like whack-a-mole. You know, it's funny. You know? So when I come so. out here to the studio and I plug into the HDMI hookup out here, it always sets it up right. Mm. When I go into my office and hook up to HDMI, it never gets it right. Right. And it's like, those are like the two places I go between all the time. And you don't have time to fool with that. Right? Well, it's a pain in the butt. I yeah. mean, you know what? It's quick and it's easy enough to fix. It's not a huge mm -hmm. deal because... I've now, like a lot of little KDE things, I've developed little workarounds, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. this is supposedly going to address some of that. So I'm looking well, forward to it. you know, I'm, <laughs> you guys are going to love this one. I'm skeptical, but I definitely feel like I'm open-minded enough to uh, go into it with a smile on my face and see how it works to out. To me, it seems like the KDE yeah. project is just, they're going in the right direction. I have a few quibbles with it. We talked about that in Linux Unplugged. Yeah, yeah. But 
I, I, I'm li- I like most of it. When, when, when a spec list is you know, uh, improved and updated the volume mixer so it's got some nice functionality, mm-hmm. made multi-monitor support mm-hmm. better, reduced mm-hmm. RAM usage, improved file indexing. Oh, its performance has been surprisingly yeah. good. And, they're, and, mm-hmm. they're, and they just keep shaving more performance out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Relax we never it. talk about Armorock. Never, but 2.8 mm-hmm. came out. And I think it's time people get off the hate bandwagon. So Armorock, after, uh, after QT4 came around, Armorock did this big switch over to QT4, changed a lot of the UI. Oh. Tons of people got upset, bailed. Clementine was, came out of that. All kinds of stuff. Armor Rock 2.8, they call it back to the origin. I loaded it up on my rig last night. Now, I don't have it because I'm in elementary sure. OS. You know, Matt, I'm in a stage, and we're going to talk about this in the review. I'm in okay. a stage right now where I want all the options. Just give them to me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I want the widgets. I want the, the, yeah. the wallpapers and the little I want, doohickey. I, I, I want to click on a song, and I want it to look up on Wikipedia mm-hmm. for me automatically. And uh, I want a plasma widget that has yeah. a little uh, album art of what I'm watching, oh, yeah. little player absolutely. controls. I want yep. all of that stuff. Armorock 2.8 is very, very good. I was, I, I was really impressed with it. Plus, it also integrates in with the KDE file indexer. Mm-hmm. So if the search That's index cool. is aware of media on your hard drive, it mm-hmm. can immediately dy- and dynamically in real time be available to Armorock. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of like that. You know, I, and uh, what would be interesting is the, if there any performance differences between the two you know, old releases. You know, I release. have not really been using the old releases. Right. for a, I, I honestly Because I'm a Clementine guy. Not, yeah. not because I have any hatred for yeah. I don't. I just, I just, it looked interesting. I tried it. I kind of the fell UI in love is with a little it. more sane on Clementine. Yeah, I, I kind of fell in love with it. It didn't. It wasn't like rith- rhythm box. It yeah. made me want to gag. The, um, see, the thing yeah, that still really so. grinds my gears about Arm Rock is the podcast support. It's very mm-hmm. basic. You go right. to the podcast area, you, you just click a thing, you add a URL, and then you just get this long list of the RSS feed. It doesn't give you very good indication of which ones have been downloaded. True. It, That's true. It's, it's not very good. I never did podcast support. I always did my podcasting with the G-Potter, and then I would have yeah. to drop it into whatever folder right. I would be watching videos with or, you know, would be, uh, you know, what, pretty much anything, DLC or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, get your pipe out, Matt. We're going to talk about pipe light. Mm. Have you heard of pipe light? I've not heard of pipe light. So it's kind of new. It's it's interesting. Um, if I told you it's all about getting silver light on Linux, now how do you feel? <laughs> I feel like I'm having moonlight <laughs> flashbacks. <laughs> Very good. It's, it's a little different. So moonlight was it was like an open source real limitation of silver. Light. It, it was sucked. like like ganache. <laughs> um, this is taking what was done for the Netflix desktop. Okay. And making it available to every browser on your desktop by creating a standardized uh, Netscape compatible plugin. Okay. So, okay. Um, so there's actually purpose to it versus Moonlight, where it says, "Hey, look, we're like Silverlight. Oh, you can't do video. No, no you can't right. do that other. Right, because no, it's actually using actual Silverlight. Yeah. Uh, Pipelight, which horrible. allows you to run your favorite Silverlight applications mm-hmm. directly in your Linux browser of choice. The project combines the effort of Eric E. Hoover. Uh, with a new browser plugin that embeds Silverlight directly into any browser that supports the Netscape plugin API. He worked out a set of Wine patches to get play-ready DRM-protected content working inside Wine, mm-hmm. and after that, he created official Ubuntu packages called the Netflix Desktop. That's where we saw the Netflix Desktop come from, okay? That. Now we move forward. Pipeline consists of two parts, a Linux library, which is loaded into the browser, and a Windows program that is started in Wine. The Windows program is called PluginLoader.exe. It simply simulates a browser that loads the Silverlight DLLs. Oh. When uh, you hit a page that has Silverlight, um, it'll uh, it'll fire up, and you just, like, in theory, could just watch it like you had the Silverlight plugin installed natively. So I've done that. Huh. I couldn't get it installed from the AUR. It is listed, but okay. uh, under Ubuntu, and I'm on Elementary OS right sure. now. There's a PPA for it. So I just went ahead and installed it this morning. And if I go to about, yep. I, can't you? Oh, know? you did a P. About. Oh, did I misspell? Yeah. About yeah. plugins in oh. my Chrome. So if I go to about plugins, you can see Silverlight is, and I'm going to say always loud, Silverlight is turned mm-hmm. on right there, right? Now you're like, okay, so Chris is, you know, Chromium sees Silverlight, so it's going to work, right? And they talk about being able to use Netflix, right? It didn't work for me. I oh, went over I- to <laughs> Netflix.com, uh-huh. and let's just say I want to watch a little Catherine Janeway on the Starship sure, Voyager, right? Sure. So I hit play here, and when I hit play, I get this OS is not supported. You know, oh, and I wonder if it's doing uh, the browser recognition thing. That could be what's I guess going so, on. right? Maybe so I maybe, change my agent. Yeah, ch- do it. Get the, yeah. get an agent plug in yeah. and do that. Yeah, you might, you might. yeah maybe. That I mean, might I, do it. I don't know any other Silverlight content yeah. to go check out because I don't know anybody else on the web that would still use do, Silverlight, yeah. but yeah. I guess people do. Um, it's a, it's the right idea, and if it works and it is working, that's cool. So I think it would be interesting. Maybe the chat room, uh, you guys can go out and try that. Uh, try user agent change to IE whatever. Yeah. And uh, you know, with and, and a lot of times you can do the user agent with the uh, operating system as well. So IE with Windows XP or seven. Right, because yeah. it's going to say, oh, this isn't Windows. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you can trick that, hey. and then you got the compatibility with the Silverlight going on, rock and roll. 
Bob's your uncle, as hey, you would say. You're hey, 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 hey. This isn't, this isn't Windows. It's not Windows. What are you trying to do? You can bump um, the internet. However, the Netflix desktop still works just fine. I don't really know, you know, mm. I, Pipelight, you know, I don't really need it. No, because I'm doing Plex on my desktop, so I don't care. Yeah, and, <laughs> and then know, if I do like, want to watch Netflix, I just use Netflix desktop. Right. I'd rather have it in its own dedicated browser totally. anyways. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, maybe for people at work, maybe you got some sort of piece of crap that needs Silverlight or something like that. I feel for you if you do. Yeah, you got some old Pentium 2 Windows machine or something. You want, uh, you want to, like, install Linux on so, it? So uh, Chatroom has got the sure. 411. They say you mm. need to change your user agent to Mozilla 5.0 Windows NT. I thought so. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I thought maybe it was user agent thing, because that would make sense, because then there's nothing left to have a hiccup on. Yeah, yeah. That does make a, that makes sense. So then, I mean, so, okay, so like, you can do that through an extension, right? Yeah, you could just easy. have a menu option, mm -hmm. change your browser agent Into to whatever you want, beep. then go to Netflix. Bob's your uncle. You're watching Catherine Janeway on the Starship Voyager. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, Matt. That's all the news for this week. As a recent KDE convert and Arch user, trying out elementary OS for a week was a heck of a reset for me. It was right. definitely an experience. Yeah. Uh, mm. And uh, I have uh, some interesting thoughts. I know you do too. You got a little page oh, of I notes do. there too. I got some, got some thoughts. I'm looking forward to it. First, I want to thank our segment sponsor, System76. Woohoo! Bringing you this segment of the Linux Action Show. And these guys have been around for years making machines born to run Linux. Look what they, you go to System76.com, they got that gorgeous new Ultra Pro uh, oh. Ultrabook up there. Man, have we been thinking, you know, man, when is System76 going to do an Ultrabook? And when they did it, they did it right. Mm. Uh, but <laughs> I was over on their site. They have that Leopard Extreme. We've reviewed it before. Loved it. Mm -hmm. I've been, I've been, I've been really eyeballing one because I, I need a new high performance editing rig. If you go over there right now, look at this little teaser they got. The uh -huh. Leopard Extreme, fourth generation coming this fall. I, I like the minimalist text. It's just like you know, tease, tease, just a little tease, tease. Just little, a little tease. tease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, I came over here because I was looking. I, I've, I'm a huge fan of the Rattel Performance. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great machine for the size of it. If you're looking at the video version, they've got an extra monitor. You get an idea of the, you get a little perspective of it. But it's also a really, really well-built computer. Very right. quiet, very sturdy, and good performance. And now they're packing it with the new fourth-generation Haswell Ooh. processor. Right? Nice, right? Plus, you've got the Intel H87 Express chipset with that and a 4600 graphics. Well, they even do wireless optional, which is kind of a nice feature. And if you want to throw in a discrete yeah. NVIDIA graphics card, you can too. Nice. And this, to me, is one of the sweet spots for a Linux desktop mm. rig. Quiet. Super high performance, total compatibility through and through. Go over to system76.com. Check out these machines born to run Linux. Mm -hmm. I'm using my Bonobo right here, right now. Running elementary on it all week. Working great. And Working I'll bet, great. you know, that little, uh, little Rattel might make a nice media box. Oh, yes. Oh. Or even really, honestly, a good home server. Just the size oh, yeah, and, and right? because it's, it's quiet, too. That's exactly, yeah, it's, it's the form factor that really draws me to it. It's like, oh, that's yeah. really nice. Yeah. I really, really like that machine. Jakey. I want... Just send me, like, uh, a few of the old ones. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. Recycle you know, right here. you got a few of the old third generations just sitting around. Uh, yeah, send them to the Jupiter Broadcasting Recycling Program. Absolutely. You betcha. Okay, so let's talk about Elementary OS's Luna release. Ooh, this yes. Elementary OS, for those of you who don't know, has been in development uh, since roughly about April of 2011. It started initially yeah. as a group of small, high, uh, a small group of high school, college kids. Uh, it was released around Ubuntu 10.10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really when we first started talking about it, but it was clear that uh, as they moved on, they started, and it needed to start to become its own differentiated thing. And they, well, a after starting with GNOME 2 and sort of reskinning Ubuntu, mm -hmm. they've refactored it into their own desktop. They have, and it's uh, some interesting results. And as elementary OS Luna has been created, they, they've released uh, betas in between like Jupyter, mm -hmm. which uh, I was honored to, yeah. uh, I believe we were the namesake of that. And uh, they've, they've sort of, watch transitions in the Linux desktop landscape. They they were one of the first projects to actually sort of really grab onto GTK3, right. for example. When a lot of people didn't know what the hell was going to happen with GTK, they were one of the first to embrace it. They've forked a lot of projects to create their own applications to create a cohesive, mm -hmm. cohesive desktop. It's it's pretty it's pretty striking. It's some people consider it an OS ten knockoff. Some people mm -hmm. consider it just to be an Ubuntu derivative with a different cover. Right. I say it's not any of those things. I would agree with that. That I would agree with. Definitely, it's its own animal, it's kind of doing its own thing, and we certainly have some uh, deep I, thoughts on I that. I guess maybe yeah. let's start where it is the most like Ubuntu. Okay. And that All would right. be the installation. Yeah, uh, for me, the installation felt very Ubuntu-like. I didn't. If you're used to an Ubuntu install, it's going to feel very natural. Using the to Ubuntu tools, it's Ubuntu yeah. Live CD environment, it's the same Ubuntu boot menu. Which um, is, you know, if you're into that, that's certainly a plus. It's one of the better installers, I think, mm -hmm. at this point. It's, it's not bad. It's yeah. not bad. It's not, it's not my favorite, but it's one of the better. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and you, you kind of get a sense that some of the tools in there, like the update manager and a few other things, are Ubuntu-based. So you kind they of get totally that sense. Yeah. yeah. Driver's manager. But mm -hmm. there is a good amount of stuff that they have created on their own. Um, there is. Like, uh, like the system settings app, which at first kind of looks like um, uh, maybe one that might ship with Ubuntu. But when right. you, it's actually, it's, it's not. It's all of these, well, they're doing something really interesting. All of these things here, it's, it's sort of like an open platform for system settings. Mm -hmm. Programs can create modules that go into here. So I installed a couple of programs, and automatically their settings options just show up in here. Oh, yeah. So I just go to this one spot to configure that application settings and my system settings. Like, for example, I installed this tweaks application, System Tweaks, which lets you get under the hood and tweak more aspects of, the, of your elementary OS desktop than you normally would get. Uh, I was like, well, where does that install? And I start going through all <laughs> yeah, my trying, applications. You're trying right. to find it. Yeah, absolutely. And then I, oh, it's in my system settings, right? Well, and I noticed when it has a, any time any of the settings or anything, I have a toggle switch. I noticed that it looked very uh, radio switch style. Yeah, it was, yeah. uh, and which added a crisp feel to it. That was my my experience. Right, it's very crisp, very attractive. They have uh, they have created a. I don't think it's fair enough to call it a theme because I believe that is something. It short. goes a little beyond that. It's sort of a design language um, mm -hmm. that they've that they've worked very closely. Initially, it started out where some one of the developers would come up with a really great way to do uh, the look of an application, right. and then so the other developers would go in there and just copy the source code out of their app and paste it in mm -hmm. their app, and so they'd have the same look. But then, of course, one person would update something, and you'd have inconsistent exactly. applications. So they came up with this unified look that they use throughout all of their applications. Um, you you got to, I mean, just look. Is that not the best-looking file manager you've ever seen? Right out of the box, looking at it, it's very attractive. That does not mean it's free of frustration or that I'm not missing things, but I think if you consider the target market that I think they're going after, then yes, I would say that it definitely yeah. has some uh, benefits there. It's, yeah. it's certainly sexy. Visually, it's very attractive. What didn't you like about it? The only thing I didn't like about it is, and maybe, and this was just me playing with it, I, for the life of me, couldn't find options to save my life. Oh, there's none. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, which is, if you're a minimalist, that's a good thing. Yeah. And again, if you're the right person for right. this desktop, then that's okay. Like my mom or you know someone that's new to Linux. For me and for anyone that's a power user, I think it's going to frustrate a little bit because you kind of have that expectation of, well, I want to view some hidden files or maybe yeah, well, I want to so make Well, so there's some stuff you can do. Like so, you, okay. So here's what I have found mm. about elementary is mm. a lot of times at first. It looks like there's no option, but if it, I right-click, I can say show. Oh. And the other thing that threw me mm. for a loop for, I, I wanted to connect to a network share, right? Right, yeah. And you can do like SFTP colon slash slash, and you can put in a server's address sure. into the location yeah, bar. Yeah, like old school. But, but you go to the network thing at the but bottom. But there's right? no like connect to server menu anywhere, right? No, If no. you right-click on entire network, then you can do connect to server. Or, for example, yeah. like if you right-click on a folder, where is it? Somewhere in here you can right-click and you can open things as, as an administrator. Like there's hidden options in some places. So I think the message there is that once you're used to doing it the elementary way, yeah. okay, Arch users will appreciate this, you do it the Arch way, yeah. you do it the elementary way, I guess yep. then it starts to make sense. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I think that's what it is. Um, that's fair. All right. I, I, think, I think that they could maybe disclose that, but you know, whatever. So it's uh, very gorgeous. Everything oh, from yeah. the boot to the login screen, mm -hmm. which is nice. The login screen's background changes to match your yeah, background. It it's very felt a elegant little, looking. Uh, Windows like initially, kind of. Windows eight like. Yeah, Windows yeah. eight like. Yeah. Not in a bad way. It no, was, better. Yeah, it was it was more attractive. So I yeah. plus to that. Yeah, sure. Um, and then when you get into the desktop, you've mm -hmm. got yourself uh, a very, very almost. I think a lot of people mistakenly thought this was a GNOME three shell. Oh, this yeah. is not a GNOME three shell. This is the Pantheon desktop environment. It includes. Um, you know, a lot of GTK, mm -hmm. of course, but right. it includes their entire set of applications, their own custom application launcher. Um, like a lot that. of yeah, this is a this. It's very simple, but it's very good. It's like um, it's like the it's like just right. It's just well, enough. It, it has a natural flow. Again, if I'm looking at this as someone that's never used Linux before and doesn't know Linux from Windows, and I come into this, it's like okay, this this feels natural. This is nice. It and, doesn't feel like any one thing. And look what I was able to do by by enabling some community repos. There's mm -hmm. and we'll get to this in just a sec. I'm able to start this launcher here, and oh, it's just like Synapse, but yeah. it's actually a part of that. So I can type right. in Terminal. It's very fast. Yeah. That was the one thing that I took away from it was I was really shocked. I mean, I actually had to compare it to uh, the uh, LXD desktop, and it was yeah. it, uh, faster. Uh, 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 I mean, I know. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm just blown away by it. Man. I mean, yeah. pff, my mind is melted. It is so fast. This is a huge core uh, aspect of their focus, but everything that was Midori with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tabs loading at once, right. all coming up instantly, right? Exactly. And it's very, very responsive. Everything launches immediately. Like, here, I'll launch the calendar. Fires and, right and up. To put this in perspective, I did the same thing he's doing on an Atom netbook, and the speed was the same. 
Mm-hmm. I want to really drive that home. It's not just because he's running a really fast computer. It really is this quick. They had people. So. We had we had people saying that they were switching from LXDE to this. Yeah. Because of the perform. Uh, one of the things Gala, I believe, is their window manager. It has a built-in compositor, so they've they've actually done their own window manager here, and a lot like sort of the best elements of Comp is, it's very very smooth. Like I'll fire yeah, up, I'll yeah. fire up Chrome, right? Sure. And I'm looking at Pantheon. You can actually get the Pantheon desktop on Arch right now. Oh, can you really? Yeah. You can, so you can oh, get you can get the elements. That's kind of cool. Yeah. It, it doesn't yeah. work so well, but yeah. But just see when I right click in Chrome, mm-hmm. you see that this that fade in fade out. It's this very um, I don't know. It's not. It's different than just having the effect. The actual way the effect renders on the screen is very smooth. It's very well done. It's very. It's very. Maybe it feels natural. polished. It's very polished feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, like and and when I, I maximize the window, I really you know I think a lot of these effects, while they're not especially now anymore groundbreaking. Perhaps when they started working on some of these things, we'd never seen some of this. But some of the frustrations you dealt with in KDE, I think, are in fact being addressed here. Uh, yeah. For example, uh, you know the one you did the side to side, and yeah. they actually filled each window right. very smoothly. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to address as far as minimiz- minimizing is I've read in the forums in a variety of places to people say, well, there's no minimize button. Right. No, you go to the dock and you minimize the window. It here's, really is quite simple. Here's, so what so. you've just touched on is what I call the Littman's test for mm-hmm. elementary OS. If this bugs you, this OS is not for you. That's a good point. If, sure. if you're able to look at a standard desktop convention that maybe you've been familiar with for your entire computing experience and say, and if somebody takes that away, and if you hear a good reason, and you kind of think about it, and you're okay with it, and you're like, okay, I've got a good justification, there's a design reason here, there's a philosophy here, mm-hmm. I kind of see where they're going, I can go with it. If that sounds like you're that type of person, okay. then elementary OS is for you. If you're the type of person that says, no, look, the minimize button is part of a standard workflow, I've had it for years, I have a lot of windows open, sometimes I want to be able to collapse things very easily, I want a minimize button in my taskbar, well, A, you can get it back, but B... If you're that type of person where that sort of is going to grind your gears, it's going to grade against you, elementary OS is probably not for you. That makes sense. I think, yeah, I can get my head around I think that. the minimize button can literally be the Littman's test for this because the way they operate is you only need to be able to do something one way and just make sure that one way does it really well. So in elementary OS, you minimize by clicking on the dock icon. And if you think about it, you want that window to go down into the dock. So you click down into the dock. That makes sense. Just because Windows 95 told us we need to have a minimize button doesn't actually mean we have to have True. a minimize button, right? That's a fair point. No, that's definitely a fair point. And I think it's interesting in that, uh, you know, the way you expand on a window, for example, you want to you maximize that. You are not forced to right. use the little double arrow up in the corner. You can actually drag just, it. You, know, you can just go and drag it, or you can just double click it, which is an old habit for and me. And I, I want to touch on this. It's, it's oh, interesting. There's, there's functionality that's sort of hidden inside elementary OS that you don't really even yeah. know is there, but it's done elegantly. Um, let's talk about multitasking. So one of the things that you can do, you can see an overview of all of your workspaces. Well, I've actually heard people say elementary OS doesn't have multiple desktops, but if I hit the uh, meta key and S, you can actually see the different oh, desktops you pop do. up. And they're well presented, actually. Yeah, and you can create new desktops. Ooh. You can Yeah, you can move between them. Uh, it, it works very well. You can also hold down the meta key and use arrow keys to go between them side wow. to side. Yeah, real easy stuff. Um, you, you, meta key and tab will also cycle between them. Mm-hmm. You can also do meta key and one and jump to the different desktops. So it's all there. Uh, you can see all of your running applications by doing meta key A. And you see it's all, all the transitions are very, very smooth. Here's another example of where elementary OS just says, we only need to do it one way, mm-hmm. and we'll just do that one way really right. So, for example, Alt-Tab. It doesn't yeah. bring up this new, large, intrusive UI element when you Alt-Tab. It removes all of the other applications so that the only windows you can choose from, so I'll open up here, I'll open up a yeah, couple of more. Example here. Yeah, so when I switch between uh, application windows, all the other application windows disappear as I'm choosing. However, if you have a sharp eye, you look down at the bottom of the dock, it is actually cycling through Oh, and they're all highlighting. Of, yes. Yeah. So they are avoiding drawing a UI element that really is unnecessary. Everything you need to make your selection is already on the screen, the dock and the window itself. And you just choose between those. And another interesting thing I'm noticing is that when you're doing this transition between the different apps, your dock shrinks to only present yeah. the applications that Isn't you're that switching nice? between, which is very slick. Yeah, it is, it is very slick. And you can, you can, uh, you can kind of just... I uh, really wish this worked better in Arch. Yeah, I, <laughs> I really do because it's like this yeah, is not bad. This, that kind of thing there for me That's actually does help me focus in on what I want to yeah. get to. 
Um, they've also they've also got uh, hot corners. You can go into your system settings, right? And I think it's uh, desktop here. And Never been a corners. big fan of hot corners, but I know people that are, and if they work well, they can be very functional. One thing you so. could do that might make life a little easier if mm. you're really missing that minimize button is you can actually make a hot corner minimize your windows. Oh, yeah. so you could say every time I go down into this corner, minimize the window for me automatically, just yeah. to kind of solve that problem for you. If you know, for example, if that was bugging you. Um, you can, can choose the dock. It's called Plank. It's their mm -hmm. little creation there. And then you've also got some really good wallpaper choices included by default. They all kind of load in real nice and smooth. And I like the navigation flow of, as you're jumping from one setting to another. Mm -hmm. It's just very, very clean. Um, applications, uh, specifically, some of the, that's yeah, really yeah. kind of where things get a little hit. Yeah. I, you know, uh, so the one app I like the most is very minimal. It's called Cable. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I'm showing it to you right now for you folks watching the video version. Here, let me minimize everything else. Cable is uh, it's a community created IRC client, mm -hmm. and it's gorgeous. It is quite quite attractive actually, but it's very minimal. <laughs> like I can't yeah. right click and do any of my op functions mm -hmm. on anybody's user account. Yeah. But for like doing doing a show and just sitting back and watching this, extremely readable. It's uh, not distracting you. Very low resources, mm -hmm. right? So I uh, guess you can move the dock. The chat room is asking. Um, so I like cable, but that's kind of where it ends. I mean, I like mm -hmm. Geary. Everybody knows I love no, Geary. Yeah, that's, that's a no-brainer. And me. that's their default mail client. Mm -hmm. A lot of really good default choices, but let's talk about that calendar. Oh, my God. Yes. Okay, so the calendar, and, and maybe maybe I'm just, maybe I'm an idiot. I'm sure there's those that are certainly in favor of that, of that prospect, <laughs> and that's totally okay. I accept this. I put it out there. But when it comes to using a calendar, I've never had a calendar that I've used that I couldn't figure out. Um, <laughs> it's not, I think it's not that you're not figuring out. It just doesn't do very much. Well, I mean, it doesn't do anything because it's like, I mean, right. I want to, I want to add, I don't know, uh, your Google you know, calendar, uh, yeah, for like an ICS file or oh, you know, yeah, a subscription, yeah, yeah. whether it be local yeah. or yeah. you know web based, yeah. and I'm trying ver different variants of adding that into what I, I suppose is their little ad box there at the uh, top right hand yeah, corner. Yeah, it's it's what you do get it, is it done very really, well, you know, and so, it supposedly works, but. Good, Here's the secret you know. magic to this. Mm. So they are creating a lot of core applications, and you could argue that's a waste of resources, but they kind of have this one design philosophy. A lot of them are written in Lua. Well, they're unified, so I don't have a problem with that. Right. Here is the secret sauce about the Maya calendar on the elementary OS. Okay. I believe. I haven't tried this myself. Yeah. Obviously, my calendar is blank. I believe it reads the Evolution data server backend. So if you were to launch Evolution and point Evolution's calendar to your Google stuff and import your ICS files... You could then manage all of that via this calendar application. So you wouldn't have to launch Evolution every time you want to make a calendar no, update. That's okay. Okay. It's a workaround. Yeah, it's and, and I'm, I'm okay with that. So, you know, but they do offer, and I think it's the little uh, blue uh, okay. second icon in. This yeah, guy? that fella. Okay. And, or no, I'm sorry, the one next to it. My bad. The little finger? Yeah. Select a calendar. Okay. okay. Add a calendar. That's a great idea. Now, what the hell should I put in that box? Let's put fart. Yeah, I mean, all right. yeah, I know. So it create okay. So, but now there's like no color coding right. difference. And to now, them, yeah. me being a dummy, thought, well, clearly I can I can drop in an ICS file locally or even you right. Know, you want to create a calendar and then import something into it. I would think, it. even yeah. if it doesn't have write capability, yeah. I would think you could do I, something there. I, and I don't know for sure if that would work under Evolution, but you that would be your yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but okay, so I can do it with Evolution. Now, here's the other piece of the uh, apps that I have. Would it kill you to have a, a have a link to a I don't know a help file, uh, mm. something to maybe tell me what the hell I'm doing? I think yeah, you know they do have some info on their site, <laughs> you know. But, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, and and I agreed. I no, I did purposely for the sake of this experiment did not go to the site. I wanted to see what it was like for Joe Blow to park himself in front of this and fumble through. Let's talk about their so. music app. So oh, they, yeah. they've created their own music app. We were just talking about mm -hmm. Armrock. This is the sure. anti Armrock for sure. I mean, yeah, it, it is. definitely is no podcast support. No, but but it's a but it's lightweight and it does something kind of neat. Like if I'm in here, say I'm playing a little uh, Daft Punk, mm -hmm. and uh, see that. yeah, so. Playing a little uh, Daft Punk Tron Legacy. It does something neat. It goes out and finds all of the similar tracks to that one oh, automatically. See, cool. as I'm playing, mm -hmm. take a, it takes a little time as it's like analyzing the song. It's working. Sure. But it will go out and find songs that are comparable to it. Now, see, here they did it right because it says, please wait for this playlist to be updated. Yeah. That's all I want, just a little information. And they did a nice job in their, in their app for you that. You can close the sidebar if you mm -hmm. don't want to look at the art. You can bring up an equalizer, and you can turn it on, and you can uh, tweak all mm -hmm. of that. So it's very, oh, there we go. It's very core essential. And here's, so this is a great app to demonstrate the uh, elementary OS philosophy. One yes. of the reasons they say they don't have a minimize button is because they feel like applications should be state aware. You yeah. close an application, it should save its state, and when you click on the application again in your dock, it should resume. If it has to start the process or not, it should be where the user left off. Okay. Music is very much like that. If I close this application, and here I'll play music, right? If I close okay. it, continues to play, 
on, on desktops like you might expect, you get your volume control, you get mm -hmm. your con audio controls here. Yep. I click it, it brings it back up. So this is this is one of those applications where they feel like you don't need to minimize because it's supposed to save the state. But Dory's like that too. The problem with this philosophy where this always falls down is 98% of the other desktop applications don't support state. Right. They, they're not even aware of, uh, that they're on elementary OS. They have no idea. That's true. If VLC couldn't give a rat's ass that it's on elementary OS. So... This saving the state philosophy is an example of sometimes where I feel like developers are overburdening with their, with their ideal concept and users then get stuck with the actual practical limitations of that philosophy. Um, I'm okay with it only because of this. They are, in fact, instead of expecting everybody else to do it for them, they are taking the bull by the horns and choosing to actually develop their own applications that have that philosophy. So based on that, and if they continue well, to make more of them, and they do have a video app, you know, a video player app, then I'm okay with that, with that understanding. But yeah, I can definitely see that argument being valid, but I don't, th I don't have a problem with that because of the fact that they've taken you know, the bull by the horns on this one. Yeah, okay I, I think you're, yeah, you're probably right. That's one of the reasons why they're creating their own application. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, if they weren't, then no, that's stupid. Especially if it was just like in their menus and stuff, that'd just be confusing as hell. Yeah. Right. So, all right. So was there any other things on your notes we wanted to get to? Really, I think that's the main thing. Um, some disappointing factors. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I actually compared it to Linux Deepin again because I had I felt automatically had to compare that because I felt like there's that's difference. interesting. I can see that. And I think th I don't know if that's fair though. Well, no, I'm only I feel only like not this, this is like a craftsman distribution. Yeah. No, this is uh, Linux Deepin does some things better and it hmm. did some things worse. Like it was software. yeah, it was neither one was better than the other. It's just obviously Linux Deepin is much slower, um, in my opinion. And but at the same time, Linux Deepin did a much better, uh, instead of just borrowing the existing software center, they actually made their own. I would love to see them do the same thing. I don't know if I agree with you on that. I think uh, it's, I think, now, I think we both agree the software center is a disappointment. It's crap. Yeah. However, <laughs> like, <laughs> if you're going to hitch your software-centered wagon to something, it should probably sure. be Ubuntu's, right? So I kind of think for some folks, mm -hmm. especially probably folks who've bought stuff in the software center, well, okay, I'll give you, know, you that. Having the and Ubuntu so software center could be a plus. It. But I think Linux Deepin could get to that point where they do start to actually hook into that at some point. And they do need to and do so if you have uh, stuff purchased with them, sure. You could argue the software center's never ran better. I mean, like, it really it yeah, performs better. Yeah, it does better. run well. It performs better under elementary OS, I think. Well, I think it's because of the fact that they're probably using, uh, you know, using the same technology they're running some of their apps with instead of where Ubuntu is running the slowest crap most... Well, uh, and they, they, like, ship preload turned on, enabled by default yeah. on uh, elementary OS. All right, any other negatives? Um, really, I think that's pretty much the meat okay. and potatoes of it. Oh, right-clicking on the desktop. Was it me, or is that just not nothing. a thing? Not, yeah. not a thing. Um, no icons, sucks. nothing. Yeah, and again, it's minimalist, and I understand that, but for me personally, that wasn't something I was a fan of, so I have to go into my file manager to right-click and create text files and things like that. That's extra and clicking. That's a hassle. So minimalism, I think, can be done right, mm -hmm. and minimalism can be done wrong. I think GNOME 3 is an example of minimalism that's gone a little wrong, a little awry, right? Yeah, painfully wrong. Yeah. I think this is minimalism where every single choice has had a lot of consideration by people who are really thinking about this. And I, I honestly could see myself using this desktop full-time because it's so damn fast. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when you have fewer options, assuming the options are set correctly, when you have Got fewer it. options, for me, I seem to be able to process what's on the screen faster. So do I. And, and I have severe ADD, so this is a good thing. Uh, maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Maybe it's my ADD. But I, I feel like I get more done when I have to make less choices. That's true. Now, that said, you, you, know, you can install things like the elementary tweak or decomp editor, right? And you can go in there and you can, you can play around in decomp just like the good old bad days of the registry, really, yeah. if you want to. So it's not that you can't get under the hood. Yeah, and you can get yourself a minimize button if you wanted. You know, I mean, through that, I believe. Uh, now, here's my, and I, like, I installed, a, by one, of the, mm. one of the things I think is really, really a positive sign for elementary OS, and one of the things I think it's going to make a contender, mm. I think it's a real challenge to Mint. I think it's a big oh, challenge yeah. to Mint. Yeah, I would agree. It's Ubuntu 12.04.2 based, and one of the things that I think is a great sign is you have some good community resources propping up, like elementaryupdate.com, kind of like an OMG Ubuntu for elementary OS, and one of the posts they have is top 10 things to do after installing Luna. And they've got some really good stuff in here. Oh. Like, that's where I got that yeah. launcher. I thought that was a great tip. You mm -hmm. know, getting Chromium on here, getting Firefox, right. tweaking the UI a little bit. Some really good stuff. Really good community. And some of the apps I've been using, like that, uh, like the chat IRC mm -hmm. app, uh, Cable, are created by the community. Some of the best that's stuff. That's really is, cool. I think that's a great sign. That's a very good sign. And but you pointed out that it, you know, it could be a contender with Mint. I think that's true, except Mint does have Mint tools that are dealing with different stuff than your right. applications. But they're so. working on building their tools, too. And if they do, then I think Mint's in trouble. I think once that comes to fruition, I think yeah. then, yes, now and, we have a contest. And I think as we watch Canonical go, go down this mobile route, 
Wouldn't wow. it be great if you had if you had elementary OS right. and Mint sitting back, maintaining that Ubuntu base that has that application compatibility? And we can't kid ourselves. I've been running Steam on Arch now for months, mm -hmm. and there's been a couple of games that just don't start for me. Right. I installed those same games under elementary OS, and they start flawlessly. Right. Okay? Exactly. Yes, it's kernel 3.2. There are means of updating that. I mean, the downside is... I think elementary OS's biggest downside is that old Ubuntu repo, mm -hmm. right? I don't yeah. like old applications. That's why that's, I want Arch. That's, yeah, that's why I find myself saying, gosh, if I could just bring this desktop over to uh, Arch or Manjaro or something else, that's not, that, you know, I get to uh, access the repository. But, for example, mm -hmm. I could never get Planetary Annihilation to mm -hmm. start. Uh, it starts beautifully, hmm. first try, under elementary OS. By the way, Strike Suit Zero is out. Amazing game. Let's see if I can start it real quick. Um, great space shooter. It's out. Runs just fine under elementary OS. Uh, nothing really knows. It's not under Ubuntu. And I, I, I think that's. I think there's more to that than people give credit to. And I, I still say that now after using Arch for months. Mm -hmm. I put my foot in my mouth originally, saying, you know, the application availability was hor horribly skewed. I would still argue it is still slightly more skewed towards Ubuntu. And elementary gives you a lower resources desktop than Unity. That's, it, and that's the piece that I like. Seems yeah. to perform better than straight up Ubuntu as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, no, and, no question. And with, when you consider all the applications they've included, they have their own windowing manager, they have their own windowing desktop, their own desktop. I, well, now that I understand how you get to some of those settings, now I'm, I'm, I'm hating the file manager list, so that's good. So yeah. uh, would you like to resume? Yeah, okay. I'll just show you real quick. Yeah, Strike Suit Zero, new game I got. And, uh, you know, this is an Ubuntu-compatible game, and mm -hmm. I'm able to run it under elementary OS with really zero issue. And, and not, that, not that I'm sure I couldn't get it working under Arch, right? But the fact is, as a gamer, I just want to sit down and just play. I don't really want to have to fight it. So here we go. Take a look, Matt. It's a new space Woo! shooter. Yeah. That's gorgeous. Where is everyone? <laughs> this place is normally packed. Ahead is what's left of the UNE frigate Pandora. Oh, I, no, I can play that. Yeah, yeah. so the I can just kind of unstable. enjoy it. Now, maybe for some reason it could start to find under Arch, but for me, I couldn't, and I really, really, really wanted to play this game. Because this, right. you know, look, at this is, this is a straight-up, legit space shooter. And by the way, after you get out of the ship, mm -hmm. you get into, like, a mech suit in space. Oh, see, that's what... <laughs> yeah. now, now we're having a conversation. Yeah, oh, okay. I know. Okay. So anyways... Uh, yeah. Very, very good. Gaming is fantastic. It, it just like you get on Ubuntu, they have the experimental NVIDIA um, graphics driver available, so you can get a later version of the NVIDIA graphics. I don't think it's quite as as new as what's in Arch, but sure. it's it's like the it's it's a later series. That's there we go. Good. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, I don't need to sit here and play this game all day, but sure I could. You do. I could. <laughs> and I was very happy that that stuff worked just fine in Elementary O. So when I was looking at this, I thought, gosh, you know. Very easy, minimal UI. Works mm -hmm. very well with multi monitors. Right. No, um, that matters to me because I do have more. And like one. you know, like and they have they've included their own terminal because if you remember they removed transparency from the GNOME terminal. Mm -hmm. But like mm -hmm. and here's a little, well, I can I can type in this little launcher. Oh, I fire nice. up, boom, terminal launches right up. It's super fast. I love oh, that. Yeah. I like it a lot. I like the community that's being built up around it. Mm. I'm not at the point right now, as a Linux user, right, where I want all of my options taken away. Because yeah, I've been abused, kind of right? Thing. I yeah. feel like I've been that beaten spouse who was married to Gnome and mm -hmm. then came home one day and Gnome got drunk. Or you feel like you're going back to one of those old legacy operating systems where you're trying to get away from all those decisions being made for you. Right. That, you know, if they've got uh, The Road to Luna. We'll link to it in our show notes. It is a great blog post. It explains a lot of the philosophy. Mm -hmm. I can wrap my brain around so much of what these guys are talking about. So I don't, you know, this to me is, this is a, uh, if you have any kind of smug um, preconceptions about what elementary OS is, you are the person that needs to download this distribution and go take a look because I, I think this is sort of a snapshot of where Linux has come. You've got all of these components that have come together. You've got a good base right. with great commercial support. And then you've got a team who are really focused on desktop. They're not getting distracted by mobile. They're really focused on just creating a desktop. And they're willing to work on it years to get it right. They're willing to work on it for they put years. It crazy time. And, and what's also interesting is the people say, well, it looks like OS 10. Well, I, as a matter of fact, I parked an OS 10 using wife in front of it, and yeah. she said, well, this looks like Linux to me. This doesn't... I don't really... I mean, because yeah. it has so a dock, it, right? It has a dock. You know, to a true Mac user, and most people that have tried this will agree, it does not feel like Mac. And ask Mac users. They'll tell you. It, it just doesn't. 
No, it's its own animal, and that's a good thing. Exactly, it's its own animal. I'm, I'm pretty, sure. I'm pretty happy with it. I don't, I won't be switching necessarily. Mainly, I would love to get this. I wish it worked on Arch. Exactly. It, I mean, that's like, if keep, I could get that. Like, I'm gonna keep playing. So when I installed, I installed yeah, everything. I installed yeah. all of this stuff, but mm -hmm. KDM just doesn't show it as an option. Weird. If I could just figure out how to get it launched from KDM, I think I could run Pantheon GDM? on Arch. Maybe. I tell you, yeah, I could maybe. I, try mean, I know that's a painful yeah. alternative, but yeah. honestly, to run it, yeah. to me. It's like it's it, everything about elementary OS is perfect, mm -hmm. except for the user package repository. Right. Or, uh, I'm sorry, the distro package repository. Exactly. I don't want to be tied to an Ubuntu package experience. Not that I'm knocking. It's just not for me. It's just not current enough anymore. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah it's. But uh, anyways, go check it out. And if you're trying out elementary, also go check out elementaryupdate.com. Mm -hmm. They go into the community PPA where there's a bunch of great applications the community are working on. Damn. That also. There's people who are passionate about creating desktop applications for this environment. Because it's so well done, because it's so polished, people are getting excited about working on it. So their team is getting larger, their contributions are getting larger, so they've set up this community PPA for people out there that are creating amazing applications and for this desktop. You mentioned that the IRC client was, in fact, a community-created mm -hmm. uh, application, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm really shocked that not only is it uh, not done by the official developers, but it doesn't look like crap, because a lot of community-developed apps look like crap. Right. And that was really, it's like, right. wow, it actually felt consistent I think and in line. You know, they've got that established design wow. language that people can, they've got, they've, they've created like libraries so people can call into those into their applications to make them look right. They've got ways of handling things that are, are different and unique. Mm -hmm. They've done a lot of under the hood fine tuning. It's not just the 1204 right. uh, base with, the, with, a, with a different desktop environment. They've done a lot of core tweaking. I think it is fair to call this elementary OS. I think it is a, an entire it's a operating system. It's a minimalist desktop. If you like minimalism, you like this. Yeah. If you want options, you don't like this. And this th makes it nice and simple. That minimalism you. extends to what's installed, too. Like, I right. went to install Wine, and I just got this huge page of depths because <laughs> right. you didn't need that stuff, so mm -hmm. it didn't, they didn't install it. Which is fair. And it fits mm -hmm. on a CD. So that's something, I like too. that, too. Yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, a lot of positive things to say. I'm going to sit here. We're going to ruminate it. I bet you we'll have a lot of follow-up in oh, the sure. Linux Action Show Unplugged. Oh, the Unplugged, we're going to be all over this, I'm sure. Of it. Yeah, I think we'll have a lot to talk about. But uh, we've, got, we've got relevant links where you can check out some of the multitasking mm -hmm. options. You can look at Panth getting Pantheon on Arch. And I've also got links to their blog post that explain some of the design philosophies behind the elementary OS. And if any of you Arch users have figured out how to get past the KDM KDM issue yeah. uh, when it comes to uh, Pantheon. We're How do really I start interested. it? How do we get it to make a peer? Because, man, oh. pa Pantheon with the Arch user repository. Mm. Oh, goodness. That mm. would be some hot stuff. That's like a hot weekend in Vegas, man. hey yo! All right, Matt. Mm. That's the Linux Action Show's look at elementary OS Luna. <laughs> it's time for Slash Etsy, and this week's Slash Etsy is brought to you by Untangle. Go to untangle.com slash last. Go get yourself a Linux-powered firewall. It's flawless. You just put that thing in there, and it just runs for freaking years, folks. I'm telling you, I've got some of these that I've probably deployed five years ago, and they're still wow. running to this day. Absolutely, champs. Untangle takes the power of Linux and puts it in a firewall that can protect your network of maybe one or two nodes to thousands yeah. of nodes. Plus, they have superior content filtering capabilities that go far beyond other competitive products, and they've got a great... Great, great anti-spam and malware filter if you've got some Windows boxes on your network. And what's nice with this free ISO, when you go to untangle.com slash last, you can check it out and see what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Load on a machine you want, put that on the edge of your network and see what it can do. But when you're ready to upgrade, you really want to get some stability and some long-term reliability, go get yourself one of their appliances with Untangle Preloaded. These appliances are quiet, small, fit right in the rack, and do one thing and do it very well. Be an awesome firewall. When you're over at untangle.com slash last, they got the download link for the ISO so you can see what that OS is about all on your own. And if you decide to get some services, you can extend, or I'm sorry, you can take 20% off a one-year subscription by using the code LAST20 when you check out. Nice. LAST20, Matt. LAST20. They're one of the only, and this is one of the things I love about Unt Untangle, one of the only multifunction firewall vendors that sells directly to their customers from their website. So you don't have to play the salesman game where he's got his markup and you've got to call him and he'll call you back and That's then he wants right. to make sure you order because he wants to get his commission. None of that. None of that. You want to get a price? You're working on a quote late at night for a client of yours? Mm -hmm. Just go over to untangle.com slash last. they got everything right there and they'll sell it directly to you. No fuss. No muss. Thanks to Untangle. Big thanks. Easy URL to remember. Untangle.com slash last. Woo! So, this week in Slash Etsy, we're going to do something different. We're turning it around on you guys. So... We kind of thought it'd be great to open up this, this segment here in the show for user submissions of things you guys are working on, things that you think would be great to share with the broader Linux community. And now that we have that new Linux Unplugged show, it kind of gives an opportunity to 
bring people on board into that show, let you get your feet wet in Linux right. unplugged. See what you guys are talking about, kind and then vet what's going on. And yeah, then, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then bring you into the big show, and we'll talk about it in a future slash Etsy. Cream of the crop. So what we're thinking is, we'd like you to get a hold of us if there's something. Maybe you've got a great setup. Maybe you've got something interesting you're working on. Maybe you've got an open source project. Anything like that. I mean, you know, like yeah. we know there's all kinds of great stuff out there. Stuff that you might. I mean, even if we're like able to do it, maybe you have more time or more invested in, and you're excited about, it and you want to convey that and get us excited about yeah. it. That's a good time to do it. You know, like for an example, one thing. This is. That'd be maybe a little dry, but sure. we never really talk about ZFS on Linux. I'm always talking about ZFS on FreeNAS. If you've got right. a big ZFS on Linux setup, you could show us that. If you've got a cool virtualization setup, you got something neat with your Linux box, we'd love to see it. What we're thinking we're going to do is we'll arrange with you via email. So you email us in LinuxActionShow at JupiterBroadcasting.com, which you want to cover. And then we'll set up a time with you, probably on a Monday, to Skype yeah. in to Linux Unplugged. We'll chat in the show, just mm -hmm. hang out with yeah. you. And then in a future episode of Last, we'll just Skype you up, and you'll just walk us through your passion project, and we'll just sort of do a little Q&A, and you can show it to us, and we'll share it with the community. Share your enthusiasm. Cool. Now, I was thinking, if anybody got crazy and wanted to do like a good old-fashioned how-to screencast, you could pre-produce that and send it into the show as well, and we would take that if it was of a certain quality. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of options we want to work with, but to underscore, here's the plan. Email us in your idea, linuxactionshow at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Then after a little bit, you'll hear back from us, and we'll probably schedule you to come on Linux Unplugged and chat with the community, and then we'll work things out there, and then we'll probably move you into the big show where we can put everything put together and deliver it to the folks. Good idea. I think it's going to be a good way to get a bunch of new stuff into the show that we've never really even considered before. Well, and I think it also helps us deal with, uh, there's probably a lot of great ideas that have been submitted to the subreddit or to the yeah. email, and we're not aware of it, and this gives us an opportunity to begin to scoop some of that up and mm -hmm. really put that to work. Totally. That means you guys got to send it to us. Yeah. So Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com. We'd love to hear your ideas. Also, your suggestions. You can also send those in if you've been thinking about working on something, and then we can always go out there and find anybody who might be doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, down the road, we might try to do some panel stuff, too. So if we hear from a few of you who are working on the same thing, we might get a couple of you in here to get different takes on how you really work cool. on that project. Yeah. I like that idea. So uh, all of that is part of what's going to be coming into Linux Unplugged, uh, which we're right now doing on Mondays. We're going to try to work a lot of that live so you guys can call in and chat about stuff and, and kind of bring in attention to what you're working on, even if it's if something kind of you're just starting. I'd like to Definitely. hear that. So. New projects, great place to get it started. All right, folks. So email us, linuxactionshow at jupiterbroadcasting.com. <laughs> And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Hey, Matt. Yes? Before we get out of here, I thought we'd cover some feedback. All right. A couple of quick ones this week. First one comes in from in the subreddit. Okay. He says, uh, well, I did it. I made a simple podcast player that I've been wanting. Mm. I'm not sure how many of you are interested, but here's a demo. And yeah, it's a single HTML mm. file, and it uses local storage. It needs mm -hmm. JavaScript to be turned on, obviously. Okay. Sure. Fair enough. And it's limited by whatever media your browser can play natively. Chromium seems to be a lot better in this respect than Firefox. Seems fair. Here it is. Here it is. It's called Ooh. Pod Bastard. Oh, that's I like cool the name. name. I like the name. And you see, you got your feeds. You can so like for example, if a person was so compelled, they could go over to uh, hold on. They could go over to Jupiter Broadcasting. Have you heard of Jupiter? Have you heard of Jupiter Broadcasting? .com? I have yeah. heard of it. It's ringing a bell somewhere. Yeah. Well, if you go over to one of our shows, like <laughs> Linux Unplugged, and yeah. you scroll down, you got these RSS feeds here. Boom! I could take this RSS feed, copy it, and then I could pop it into there and paste it. And then you can add the feed, and bam, now I'm subscribed to Linux. And it's, it's just a nice little web. It's clean. Yeah, very, exactly. Very clean. Really clean. And, and I really there's the player. like it, yeah. actually. Yeah. So that, now it's playing that episode of the Linux Action Show. I can definitely see some ajax -y going on there. Pretty snazzy. Yeah, it's a great work. Ooh. Ooh. And you I guys, like uh, we have a link to that if you want to check it out. He's also got the code up on GitHub, so you could uh, deploy it on your own machine. Yeah, and hopefully we don't crash your server if we do. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Steve writes in, Hi guys, I've been contemplating rolling my own email server. I understand that home internet email is most likely blacklisted by spam filters. Okay. What is required to do your own email? A VPS to host a solution? GoDaddy email? Privacy is my main concern mm -hmm. as I want to own the email and I'm thinking about using Zimbra. I'm looking to have a web email interface, so what do you suggest? I'm going to have a listener of last quarter radio text app and I up my monthly donation to help support on Filter. Love the shows. Oh. So, Boy, oh, that's... It's a tough one. We've been kicking this around. We mm. kicked this a little bit around in Linux Unplugged. Rolling your own emails around. I think this is a topic we've got to do on the show. Hey, people are asking for it. I think we've got yeah. to do it for sure. Now, uh, the, he, he touched on a main issue. When you run email from your home internet connection, A, you could be in violation of your cable provider, of your internet providers. Most uh, of the time you are, unless you're on a business class, then sometimes not. But, you know. And you will probably end up in... 
spam filters. There are services like Postini and MailRoute where instead of the mail actually coming directly to and from your mail server mm -hmm. at your home connection, they actually go to and from MailRoute, and then MailRoute forwards it to your home box. Mm -hmm. MailRoute's got a good, trusted reputation. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get blacklisted, and that sort of alleviates that problem. The advantage okay. there, too, is you can have MailRoute spool up your email, so that way if your home connection goes down or your home server goes down, you don't lose any emails coming into you. They'll just and and for someone that's not familiar with MailRoute, is this a a, a destination, a company, a nonprofit? Yeah, it's one uh, of many. I, it's one that it's one that I'll probably be using. It's one I just used recently. Okay. MailRoute is uh, probably should be sponsoring. Um, yeah, but they are uh, they are a service where you route your mail through them, okay. and they 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 also are a spam filter service, virus filter service, and they do store and forward. Wow. So you can have your email stored for 15 days before it bounces back, and then when your server comes back online, it just forwards it all to your box. Paid service, free. Uh, paid, paid. Okay. You get a 15-day free That's trial. That's good. Um, Leo likes them. That's good to know. Yeah. Now the uh, <laughs> the downside would be is you are negating some of the benefit of moving mail off the cloud because you're tunneling through them essentially. Exactly. Okay. So in theory, if you are worried about a subpoena. <laughs> Oh, of yeah, tracking yeah. your metadata or something like that, they, the federal government can just go to MailRoute mm -hmm. and monitor it there. I don't know. I'm just kind of... Just something to be guessing. aware of. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. if that's your purpose, sure. Yeah. Now, um, it's still probably better off than if you're on some sort of mail service that has millions and millions of other users like Gmail or Outlook.com. A little security through obscurity, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of working on this. I recently rolled an email server for my grandparents. I'm kind of seeing how that plays out. Mm -hmm. And if that plays out well, I'll probably roll the same thing for my house. And I might use something like MailRoute. So if you're wanting to avoid a MailRoute situation, you basically you're saying uh, run your own hardware, be in control of your own hardware. And business has, class line. Business probably. class line. Okay. And then you probably don't need MailRoute. I'm sure you wouldn't. No. Yeah, unless, unless for some reason your IP was in a range that has gotten uh, some crap in the past. We've got a lot of emails about this, so probably in the next week or two, the Linux Action Show will cover rolling that. So I'd love to hear okay. your suggestions, what you've done for your own email server. Have you rolled it a VPS? I know a lot of folks are doing that. They're going to get in a VPS, but then they're trying to decide, like, which is the right VPS. Which one you trust more. Should it be outside the U.S.? But yeah. then if it's outside the U.S., everything I communicate to it is likely being monitored. Exactly. So then, you know, how's my encryption going to work? So there's a lot of variables in rolling your own mail server, including reliability, mm -hmm. deployment, mm -hmm. what software you're going to use. If you want to build your own or use an open source package like Zimber that sets a lot of it up, but then maybe you lose control if something goes wrong. I'd love to hear your guys' insights on yeah. this because these are all things I'm kicking around. So send us an email, linuxactionshow at jupiterbroadcasting.com or pop the contact link or even better, thread in the subreddit. That'd be cool. Be interested in hearing your motivations too, like what's, uh, what's your push. Yeah, why, what's your push? What's your, uh, what's your interest in it? What's your, uh, I agree. You know, whatnot. I had, chat room uh, says typewriters. That's what number six is. Typewriters. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. cool. We also, uh, about four episodes ago or so, three episodes ago, it comes up from time to time in TechSnap, and Alan and I went into some of the other downsides to running your home email server. So some of that's been covered in TechSnap. Now we're going to cover some of the actual, I think we'll get down to the nitty-gritty implementation cool. details in a future last. Probably talk a little bit more about it tomorrow on Linux Unplugged. Gnarly. All right, Matt, anything you want the folks to know about before we um, head out? Matt Hartley Public on Facebook. You can find me there. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I'll plug jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Because you never know if something's going to get moved around. Especially with Linux Unplugged or uh, yep. LAS Unplugged. It kind of gives you yep. some idea of what's going on. Yeah. So I've got, really so like I've got, uh, I'm going to change the name Linux Unplugged because I called it last. I think I like Linux Unplugged. So yep. we're going to change it. On the calendar right now, we got a 2 p.m. on Monday. But mm -hmm. if we do adjust it, that's where you'll see the update reflected. JupiterBroadcasting.com plus calendar. And look right there, Matt. Subscribies. Hand, yeah, you can you can add to your calendar. And then it gets into your uh, time Ooh, zone. Oh, 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 I see a time zone converter. Time, yep. Click that link and you convert times. But if you do add it to your Google Calendar, Google solves that for you. That's true. Time yeah. math made yeah. easy. Time math. And you could also, we just got a straight up RSS feed, so you just throw it in any cool. calendar program you like, I except for the calendar program. Yeah, then good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> no offense, guys, but yeah, I'm just saying. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Oh yeah! <laughs> nice. Captain's Log, Stardate 21447835, Mark 321. I've entered into the Galaxy Note 2 to reset the factory dupes. Computer, establish a security code for access to all functions previously transferred to bridge. Enter code. One seven three four six seven three two one four seven six Charlie three two seven eight nine seven 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 six four three Tango seven three two Victor seven three Tango seven three two Victor seven three one one. So okay, this is what I think. <laughs>
I, I will never be able to do a good Patrick Stewart uh, or a good Sean Connery. But if I could just nail somewhere in between there, if I could be like, if I could be like drunk Patrick Stewart showing up on set, okay, okay, imitating Sean Connery during his ah, captain's okay. log, just to give himself a giggle. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the 274th episode of the Linux Action Show in year seven and season 28, episode four, and it begins in three, two. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Linux Action Show season. Jesus, man. Yeah. 28, episode four. Is All this right. season Jesus already? God, you know, I kept <laughs> thinking we were like, some, I thought we were somewhere else, you know. <laughs> 